Hi everyone, and welcome to the AI Hardware Show. In this series, we're going to talk about chips and AI silicon. Joining me, as always, is the lovely Sally Ward-Foxen from EU Times, and this episode is brought to you by IBM. More about them later in the show. But first, let's roll that intro. This episode is sponsored by IBM. Did you realize that IBM is in AI hardware? If you didn't, then you should be watching more of this channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe. But we'll hear more about IBM later in the episode. So welcome everybody to the inaugural AI hardware show. Sally, so good to see you again. Great to be here. I've got Sally on here because she is the AI expert at EE Times. She's, she's, she's so down to earth, she won't tell you that she is. But in preparation for this series, I asked her, how many AI company chips do you follow? Because my list is about 70. Mine's closer to 80. Um, but I follow a lot of companies that don't make AI accelerators that just run AI on their hardware as well. Ah. So it's a lot, right? It's uh, We had to pick and choose which hardware to actually talk about. This it's uh, Yeah, it was tough to cross them off the list towards the end. But you'll, you'll have to keep watching to find out who made it. We're planning... Plenty of episodes for this. This is a 2023 edition of the show. Next year, hopefully 2024 and 2025. This is a very fast-paced space. I mean, I can barely keep up. There'll be more companies for sure. While we're filming, more companies are popping <laughs> oh, up. Of so course. Absolutely. Or maybe some companies will fall by the wayside. Well, we'll find out about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next episode, yeah. <laughs> We've had to uh, already change scripts <laughs> yeah. in the last week because of that. Things move quickly. So to start off this episode... I'm going to talk about a couple of minutes on the Google TPU. TPU, Tensor Processing Unit. It's hard to not talk about AI chips and hardware without mentioning the behemoth that is Google. At the same time, they are quite hard to talk about because Google has this weird ability to only mention the chips publicly about a year or so after they've been in use. Today, Google's latest public announcement has been around its fourth generation TPU, the Tensor Processing Unit with custom designed silicon specifically for Google's internal machine learning workloads. Now this is the fourth generation. All of Google's generations of TPUs have focused around the idea of a systolic array compute system using a synchronous mesh of multiply accumulate units. Weights and activations are then streamed into the units at right angles, allowing the results to be passed on to the next units in the grid without requiring those expensive trips out to main memory. This means the data flows through the chips in waves like a heart pumps blood. Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. Compute, compute, <laughs> compute. Systolic arrays are good for large blocks of compute, and you can make a large 512 by 512 array to get the job done. But an array that large wastes power, especially if it makes more sense to calculate matrices that are much smaller than the array dimensions. However, you make the array dimensions way too small, and there's no real speed up as you're still transferring data, which is the benefit of a systolic array. So the first generation of Google's TPU supported one 256 by 256 matrix multiply unit at 8-bit precision, followed by a 32-bit accumulate. This, the second generation, split this into two 128 by 128 arrays, as this was more efficient as the workloads in machine learning evolved. Now, in its fourth generation, each TPU v4 has four of those 128 by 128 systolic arrays, but they're now capable of bfloat 16 inputs with FP2, 30, FP32 accumulation. They each have 32 gigabytes of HBM2 and up to 192 watts per chip. Google can put up to 4,096 chips together into what they call a pod for 1.1 exaops of BF16 or Int8 compute. These are available in the cloud today. Up next, Sally's got a fun GPU. Let's take a look at the GPU against which all other AI chips are measured today, the NVIDIA A100. This is NVIDIA's current generation hardware based on its Ampere architecture with the third generation of Tensor Core. When it was released, this chip was said to be the biggest generational leap in NVIDIA's history, with 20x the performance of the previous Volta generation. It has double the HBM memory of the previous gen, with 2 terabytes per second memory bandwidth. This generation introduced the TF32 number format, 
NVIDIA said at the time that this is the right balance of precision versus accuracy and improves the through throughput versus single precision, which was previously used for most training jobs. Performance on the new TF32 format is 156 teraflops. For in-date inference, uh, peak performance is 624 tops. NVIDIA also added new sparsity features to the TensorCore's ramper, so it supports fine-grained structured sparsity. This means it can go even faster on sparse matrices or tensors where there are lots of zeros. It can double the throughput. A100 also introduced a feature called multi-instance GPU or MIG. The idea is that since this chip is way bigger than needed to do inference on smaller networks, you can effectively break it into as many as seven smaller GPUs of different sizes and run multiple smaller models simultaneously without having to share memory bandwidth or cache. A100 also features upgraded NVLink and NVSwitch interconnect to bring its GPU to GPU bandwidth to 600 gigabytes per second. A100 is widely used today in AI training and inference in the data center at enterprise scale, in hyperscale installations, and in supercomputers. So up next is a chip I've actually been touching recently. <laughs> very, very rarely that we touch chips in this industry. Unless but, it's been in your mouth. <laughs> uh, yeah, unless I've had a big chomp. Uh, but this one is IBM's Artificial Intelligence Unit. Now, IBM has this AI hardware center. You may or may not have heard of it. It's had about $2 billion of funding, plus a little bit more from the state. And as part of that, they have four pillars of research which they're doing, one of which is towards this sort of low-precision digital compute, which has culminated in the third generation of its new AI IP. This IP they've put into what is a 5 nanometer chip called the Artificial Intelligence Unit, the AIU. And what's special about this chip is that it supports instructions down to int2 inference. That's 2-bit inference. I mean, it does the 16 and 32-bit stuff as well, and it's meant to do training and inference. But the fact that it does int2, it, you know, I essentially asked the question, what about int1? And they said, research still going on. Right now, this chip is still in the prototype phase. They have silicon. Uh, they're in the process of building out, building a software stack. It's going to go into IBM Cloud for IBM's B2B customers. But in the longer term, they're going to essentially make it f more freely available to those sorts of B2B units, either to deploy on-prem or uh, in the cloud, or a hybrid of the two. IBM is a big proponent of this, you know, sort of hybrid cloud. The chip itself is uh, essentially a bigger version of the IP we see in the IBM Z16 processor, where that has one core and does mostly transactional inference for big financial workloads. This is 32 cores, and it's more dedicated to essentially where NVIDIA's uh, T4 or A10 currently plays in. So we're looking at a maximum of 75 watts. Uh, it uses LPDDR4 or 5. I didn't actually get a clear answer when I asked. Um, but they're showing impressive tops and tops for what numbers. We're going to get more detail about the speeds and feeds next year. But this is undoubtedly going to be the first chip from the collaboration. And then today's show sponsor is actually IBM. This episode is sponsored by IBM. IBM has spent more than $2 billion on its AI hardware center, focusing on digital cores, analog cores, heterogeneous integration, and testbed systems. If you're interested in getting involved in AI, either academic or commercial, then IBM's AI Hardware Center is a great place to be in order to combine both knowledge about hardware and software, full stack solutions, all that lovely stuff. Plenty of videos on this channel have been sponsored by IBM about their AI strategy. I highly suggest you go check them out or click in the links in the video description below. Could China's answer to NVIDIA be set to beat the GPU giant at its own game? Startup Biren has developed its own GPU technology for AI training and inference in the data center. The flagship BR100 uses two identical chiplets plus four stacks of HBM2E. The performance is two petaops for N8 or 265 teraflops for FP32. Burn also has a new number format it's using, which it calls TF32+, Plus, which is E8M15. It's more precise than NVIDIA's TF32 format, but it also simplifies the design of Burn's tensor core because it can reuse the BF16 multiplier. Using chiplets for the design meant Burn could break the reticle limit but retain yield advantages that come with smaller die to reduce cost. Compared with a hypothetical reticle size design based on the same GPU architecture, the two chiplet BR100 has 25% more die area, but achieves 30% more performance and 20% better yield. Another advantage of using chiplets is that the same tape out can be used to make multiple products. Buren also has the single chiplet BR104, which comes on a PCIe card. 
Benchmark scores for the single chiplet BR104 show it offers similar performance to NVIDIA's A100 for a server mode where there's a latency constraint, but comfortably outperform the A100 in offline mode, which is a measure of raw throughput. We don't have benchmark scores for the two chiplet version yet, unfortunately, but maybe it's coming soon. Buren's also developed a chip to chip interconnect called B-Link, which is 412 gigabytes uh, per second between BR100s in a server. There's eight ports per chip, and there's already servers commercially available from Chinese server maker Inspur. So the fun thing about Biren is that they're currently one of the victims of the current geopolitical situation. Stay tuned after this episode and following the links in the description to for the After Show podcast, where Sally and I will talk about this in more detail, because it affects more than just Biren. So on my side, I'm going to speak about another GPU. Now, AMD has had its Radeon Instincts line for a couple of generations now, and the biggest member of that family is the MI250X. Now, in high-performance computing, it's hard to move. Get your elbows out, because there are MI250Xs everywhere. Top Seven of the top 10 supercomputers today, a couple of weeks ago when we were filming this, it was eight, but now it's seven, of the top 10 all use AMD Radeon Instinct MI250Xs to get their high performance. This is all using a HP Craze Shasta system with a slingshot architecture, but also these systems occupy some top spots in the green 500 as well. One of their big overriding features is that the MI250X is two chiplets in one package. So your peak throughput in FP64 is 93.7 teraflops now that is pretty much insane in a single in, a, in just in a single chip very few other solutions can provide this now is fp64 really relevant when it comes to ai perhaps not nobody really needs that much precision but these chips do support lower precision modes the only downside here that reason why amd is focusing this chip more on say high performance compute than ai is a software stack AMD has been slowly improving its software stack, which it calls Rockham. It's now version Rockham 5, to go out and do both AI and HPC workloads. We're going to see more GPUs dedicated to AI in the future from AMD, but right now they're the king of the game when it comes to FP64 compute. Later on in this series, I'll perhaps be mentioning the MI300 next generation, which is set to be more of a, an APU style, CPU, GPU, and IO, which may be better suited for those AI calculations. Now, come on, Sally, save me. Let's talk about some inference. <laughs> Here we go to the edge. We're going to go straight to the edge. That needs to be a soundbite. Oh, here we go to the edge. <laughs> to the edge. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Edge Q is making a 5G base station on a chip. The reason we're including it here on the AI Hardware Show is that it has on-chip accelerators, which exploit some of the similarities between 5G and AI workloads in order to accelerate both. Edge Q has 50 identical signal processing cores on its chip. These are RISC-V cores licensed from Andes. Because they're RISC-V cores, the instruction set is, of course, customizable. If you can add your own instructions, of course, that means you can save power because you can reduce the number of cycles you need for certain mathematical operations. EdgeQ's added its own instructions for wireless communications for things like fast Fourier transform and matrix multiplication of complex numbers. The good news is the instructions they added for the 5G part can also be used for AI acceleration. That part comes almost for free. EdgeQ multiplexes the workloads together using processor cycles in between 5G transmissions to run the AI part. Why do we need AI in 5G infrastructure? It's used for things like detecting unusual network behavior that could be some form of malicious attack. But EdgeQ says it's also considering client-side applications for the same silicon, so something like a robot that runs AI but also communicates via 5G. The company has eval boards available now. So thanks, everyone. That's our first episode of the AI Hardware Show. Thanks, Sally. Uh, stay tuned. We've got plenty more episodes coming. And if you've reached it this far, don't turn off just yet. Coming up is also a podcast where we're talking about these six AI chips and companies and going into detail, a, you know, a bit more freeform about what we actually think about what's going on here. So uh, again, stay tuned. And thank you, Sally. Thank you. Let's do it.